Hi everyone, I'm Linda Reimer, one of the librarians at the Southeast Bend County Library. Welcome to Library Connections, our weekly readers, viewers, and listeners advisory video cast. Enjoy. Library Connections number 20, hosted by SSCL librarian Linda Reimer. This video cast is being recorded on Thursday, September 17, 2020. Kicking things off with the top five books on the fiction bestseller list for this week, courtesy, as usual, of the New York Times. At number one, we have Anxious People by Frederick Backman. A failed bank robber holds a group of strangers hostage at an apartment open house. That'd make anybody anxious. At number two, One by One by Ruth Ware. An avalanche tests the bonds of co-workers from a London-based tech startup on a corporate retreat in the French Alps. That too sounds like it would make one anxious, but I wouldn't mind visiting the French Alps and I'm digressing. Let me stick to the bestsellers here at number three, Shadows and Death by J.D. Robb. The 51st book of the In-Death series. A hitman with possible connections to Eve Dallas's husband is seen near the scene of a crime. At number four, All the Devils Are Here by Louise Penny, the 16th book in the Chief Inspector Gamache series. When his billionaire godfather is attacked, Gamache uncovers secrets hidden throughout Paris. And at number five, The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. The lives of twin sisters who run away from a southern black community at age 16 diverge as one returns and the other takes on a different racial identity, but their fates intertwine. And moving on to the top five books on the nonfiction bestseller list for this week. At number one, Disloyal by Michael Cohen an account of President Trump's business empire, political campaign, and presidential administration by his former personal attorney. At number two, Killing Crazy Horse by Bill O'Reilly and Martin Duggar, the ninth book in the conservative commentator's Killing series focuses on conflicts with Native Americans. At number three, Compromised by Peter Stroke, the former FBI Deputy Assistant Director of Counterintelligence chronicles the investigation into Russia's election interference and key moments from his career. At number four, Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist examines aspects of caste systems across civilizations and reveals a rigid hierarchy in America today. And at number five, Everything Beautiful in Its Time by Jenna Bush Hager. Essays by the former first daughter and granddaughter celebrating the lives of her grandparents. And that of course would be George and Barbara Bush. And that concludes the New York Times bestsellers for this week. Our first recommended read for this week is the new Christopher Pellini. It's called To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. A curious scientist stumbles on mysterious ruins in the opening chapters of this science fiction epic. Things are really turning around for Kira Navarez, an exobiologist. She's finishing up a stint doing research on the large moon Adestria with a small team of other scientists, and her boyfriend, Alan, has just proposed to her. Instead of continuing to spend months apart, working on different planets, and waiting until they can be together, they'll be able to ask their employers to make them part of a colony as a couple. As Kira performs a few routine last minute checks before their team leaves the system, 
something strange catches her eye. She decides to check it out, just to be thorough, and finds herself in the middle of an ancient structure. When her curiosity gets the better of her, and she touches a pedestal covered in dust, a bizarre black material flows out and covers her entire body. She passes out as she's being rescued by her team, and when she comes to, she seems to be fine, and the team reports her findings to the government. But soon, and you just knew there was going to be a but soon, didn't you? Especially if you've ever seen the 1979 film Alien with Sigourney Weaver, which is a great film, by the way, if you like science fiction, and I'm digressing. So watch the film Alien if you haven't seen it, and back to the plot of the book. But soon, a kind of strange alien suit takes over her body, covering her with black material that lashes out violently against Alan and the other scientists, forming spikes that jump out from her skin. A military ship comes to collect what's left of the team and investigate the reports of an alien discovery. When an alien species attacks the ship, presumably because of Kira's discovery, Kira will have to learn to harness the suit's strange powers to defend herself and the rest of the human race. Polini, best known for the YA epic fantasy series, The Inheritance Cycle, makes his adult debut in another genre that welcomes long page counts. This one clocks in at close to 900 pages, but the rollicking pace, rapidly developing stakes, and Polini's competent world building makes a fly right by. Perhaps not the most impressive prose, but a worthwhile adventure story. A fun, fast-paced epic that science fiction fans will gobble up. And that is the Kirkus Review and our first recommended read for this week. I do have just a little, little uh, thing to note here. And that is that I disagree with the reviewer when he says that this is Polini's debut in a new genre. Polini is a fantasy writer. And if you've ever read The Inheritance Cycle, which consists of four books, yes, the character, the main character is a young man. Yes, he's a farm boy. Think the hero in the Power of Myth books. But uh, it really is a series of books for anyone of any age. So not just YA. It's about a boy and his dragon going on a quest. So if you haven't read The Inheritance Cycle, which starts out with Aragon, E-R-A-G-O-N, please do. It's great fun. And for those of us that have read The Inheritance Cycle, we've got a great new book to check out. Moving on to our second recommended read of the week. This one's a mystery. It's called Troubled Blood. It's the fifth book in the Corman Strike series, written, of course, by Robert Galbraith, also known as J.K. Rowling. Private detective Corman Strike is visiting his family in Cornwall when he is approached by a woman asking for help finding her mother, Margot Bambro, who went missing in mysterious circumstances back in 1974. Strike has never tackled a cold case before, let alone one 40 years old. But despite the slim chance of success, he is intrigued and takes it on, adding to the long list of cases that he and his partner in the agency, Robin Ellicott, are currently working on. And Robin herself is also juggling a messy divorce and unwanted male attention, as well as battling her own feelings about strike. As Strike and Robin investigate Margot's disappearance, they come up against a fiendishly complex case with leads that include tarot cards, a psychopathic serial killer, and witnesses who cannot all be trusted. And they learn that even cases decades old can prove to be deadly. That book just came out too. It's the second recommended read of the week and it's definitely going on my two read pile although I usually read ebooks, so it'll be on my e-reader. And moving on to our first audiobook recommendation for this week. I changed the background here. 
I have a feeling I'll change it back to blue for next week because the black seems to kind of fade into the tan, but I thought we should have a different color. And I'm digressing. First audiobook recommendation for this week is called The Evening and the Morning. It's the new Ken Follett, written of course by Ken Follett, and read by John Lee. It's a prequel to The Pillars of the Earth, set in England at the dawn of a new era, the Middle Ages. It is 997 CE, the end of the Dark Ages. England is facing attacks from the Welsh in the west and the Vikings in the east. Those in power bend justice according to their will, regardless of ordinary people and often in conflict with the king. Without a clear rule of law, chaos reigns. In these turbulent times, three characters find their lives intertwined. The first character is a young boat builder whose life is turned upside down when the only home he's ever known is raided by Vikings, forcing him and his family to move and start their lives anew in a small hamlet where he does not fit in. The second character is a Norman noblewoman who marries for love, following her husband across the sea to a new land. But the customs of her husband's homeland are shockingly different and, as she begins to realize that everyone around her is engaged in a constant, brutal battle for power, it becomes clear that a single misstep could be catastrophic. And the third character is a monk who dreams of transforming his humble abbey into a center of learning that will be admired throughout Europe. And each character, in turn, comes into dangerous conflict with a clever and ruthless bishop who will do anything to increase his wealth and power. So this is the new Ken Follett book. And if you've enjoyed his previous books, this pretty much has the same pattern of introducing several characters and then weaving the narrative through their lives as they encounter each other and live in the same area. And there's always a bad guy. In this case, it's the bishop but it sounds like a good read and listen to. This is in the digital catalog now as both an ebook and audiobook. Our second audiobook recommendation of the week is also fiction. It's called Migrations, a novel written by Charlotte McConaughey and read by Barry Krynick. Narrator Barry Krynick's portrayal of a complicated woman struggling with personal tragedies is heartbreaking. Listeners follow Franny Stone, an Irish orthonologist with a need to wander. The audiobook recounts Franny's mission to follow migration patterns on the fishing boat she joins after first convincing the captain she can contribute to the work of the crew. While on board, Franny writes letters to her husband about her thoughts and experiences revealing a layered backstory that brings a fuller meaning to Franny's mission, including her search for her mother. Franny achieves something difficult here. Not only does she invite empathy for Franny, she also makes her entirely relatable as the larger meaning of her quest is revealed. Franny's performance accentuates the power of the story, and that is the audio file review and this one's available in the digital catalog right now as well. Moving on to our streaming recommendations for this week, the first one is a documentary. It's called All In, The Fight for Democracy, and it's available through Amazon Prime Video. In anticipation of the 2020 presidential election, this documentary examines the often overlooked yet insidious issue of voter suppression in the United States. With the perspective and expertise of Stacey Abrams, the former minority leader of the Georgia House of Representatives, this documentary offers an insider's look into the laws and barriers to voting that threaten fundamental rights. And that is a new Amazon Studios production. Moving along to our second streaming recommendation for this week, and this actually is a double feature recommendation as the films are related. 
The first one is called Bewitched. It came out in 2005 and it's available on Amazon Prime Video. It's based on the 1960s comedy TV series. Bewitched stars Nicole Kidman and Will Ferrell. The two portray a married couple. He's a regular mortal guy and she's a witch who likes to solve issues that arise with magic. The second recommendation is the film Bell Book and Candle from 1958. It's available through Pluto either as the app for your smart TV or mobile device or the Pluto TV website online. The movie can also be requested on DVD through StarCat. Bell Book and Candle is set during the holiday season of 1958. The film is based on the 1950 play of the same name and it was later used as the inspiration for the 1960s TV series Bewitched. The plot. A regular Joe, Shep Henderson, has recently moved into a new apartment. Also living in the apartment building are two magical siblings, Jillian and Nikki, and their equally magical Aunt Queenie. Jillian discovers that Shep is about to marry her old college rival, a woman she despises. So she casts a spell on Shep so that he falls in love with her instead. Thus Shep breaks off his engagement and is later steamed to discover what Jillian has done. As Shep gets to know Jillian, his feelings change and hers do too, as she finds herself really falling in love with Shep. A no-no for members of the magical community in the world of this film, because if magical folks fall in love, they lose their magical powers. The cast in this film is great, as is the music, and watching this film is a great way to take a magical trip out of our world for two hours. I highly recommend it. Moving on to our third streaming recommendation of the week. This is a TV series available through Netflix. It's called The Gift. The IMDB synopsis of this is as follows. A painter in Istanbul embarks on a personal journey as she unearths universal secrets about an Anatolian archaeological site and its link to her past. Having said that, this neat series is one of Netflix's international titles. The series features Turkish dialogue and, of course, English subtitles. It tells a great supernatural story, which is a little too complex to describe in depth in just a minute or two. But basically, a young woman named Eti, who is a painter and engaged to be married, discovers she isn't quite who she thought she was and that she has supernatural powers. In the first season, she slowly comes to the conclusion that her parents and fiance are trying to stop her from growing into her powers and discovering who she truly is. And then there is an unexpected twist at the end of the first season that sets up season two in a parallel world. So you get what I mean about it being a little bit complex, but if you like fantasy films, this is a good one. The acting is solid. It's another one of Netflix's neat uh, international titles. And I recommend you check it out. And on to the Odd Duck recommendation of the week. Hi everyone, our Odd Duck subject for this week is how to discern truth from falsehoods online particularly through social media and as a complement to that the importance of independent news sources. So with that in mind I've got three things to recommend. The first is an article that was published in the New York Times last Friday. It's the one you see in front of you here. It's called Getting Wise to Fake News. A little synopsis under that says older adults are particularly vulnerable to misinformation on social media but resources have emerged to help them learn to discern truth from false. And I would recommend anyone who goes on social media and online read this, whether they're considered an older adult or a senior or just a young adult, I would still read it. 
And if you read the article, you get to a certain point down here, which I should mention up at the top. If you want to find this online, the fastest way is to Google the title, Getting Wise to Fake News, and the author's name, Paula Spann. If you, when you read the article, you're going to notice down here that it says there is a website, MediaWise for Seniors, a project of the Pointner Institute, which offers free online courses to help older Americans detect and combat online misinformation. So if you click that link, you're redirected to this website. It's the MediaWise for Seniors portion of the Pointner website. And if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see some of their free offerings. Again, they are free. The first one here says MediaWise for Seniors Live Fact-Checking Seminar. And the application for that particular session has closed. But the second, which is the same scope, just at a self-paced setting, if you will. So in other words, once you enroll and you start doing this, if you need to stop, you can't stop and go back to it later. Uh, is available. And in this self-paced, in-depth course, Christine Amapour and Joan London, two reputable and well-known journalists, will help you improve your digital information literacy. So I would recommend that you check that out. And my third part to this is something I've mentioned before. It's the audiobook and the book, if you prefer the book, Ghosting the News. The audiobook is available in the digital catalog. Print books should be available in the system shortly. And this is on the importance of local journalism and why the decline of local journalism, independent news sources that is, is a crisis for our democracy. So I'm just going to quickly read you what they have to say about the book. And I will also note right off the top, Margaret Sullivan, the person that co-wrote this, was for a number of years the main editor at the Buffalo News. So this does have some regional connection. Ghosting the news tells the most troubling media story of our time. How democracy suffers when local news dies. Reporting on news impoverished areas in the U.S. and around the world, America's premier media critic, Margaret Sullivan, charts the contours of the damage, but also surveys some new efforts to keep local news alive. From nonprofit digital sites to an effort modeled on the Peace Corps. No nostalgic peon to the roar of rumbling presses. Ghosting the news instead sounds a loud alarm, alerting citizens to the growing crisis in local news that has already done serious damage. She explains how a lack of local news in communities results in more polarization, less political engagement, and more poorly informed citizens who are less capable of making good decisions about governance. And she does it all through the lens of a journalist who spent most of her career in local news, including nearly 13 years as the top editor of a regional newspaper, the Buffalo News. If local newspapers are on the brink of extinction, we ought to know the full extent of the losses now before it's too late. And again, the book and the audio book are called Ghosting the News by Margaret Sullivan, co-authored with Amanda Carlin. Moving on to our cute cat photos of the week. And yes, I know one of these things is not like the other. I think that was Sesame Street. Or it might have been the electric company. And I'm showing my vintage. But anyway, I digress. We have two cute cat photos a one photo of two flowers that I thought were really nice. I thought that was a sweet picture of those two little flowers, and I'll get to that in a minute. In the top left-hand corner, we see Jules in his FDR chair, and I refer to it as an FDR chair because it is one of those black wooden chairs, as like the ones you saw FDR pictured in for the fireside chats. Um, I tore it all apart and made it a cat chair instead, which, as you can see, Jules quite likes when the weather gets colder. In the top right-hand corner, we have a neat photo of Piper. I was talking to her, and she decided she had to get up and get even closer to me. And I just thought that kind of was a neat picture of her getting up and coming towards me. And at the bottom, we see a photo of two flowers, and I have no idea what kind of flowers these are. I enjoy flowers, but I know little about them. 
other than that they're pretty. But there are these flowers growing on a, a telephone pole that I walk by on my daily constitutional. And there are two of them there, and I think they're just really pretty, whatever type of flowers they are. So I thought I'd share. If you have questions about this video cast, please let me know. Send me an email. My email address is rhymerl at stls.org, and I'll get back to you. Library resources you can access from home page one, just going clockwise quickly from the top left hand corner, the library's website where you can find information about programs and events and news related stories. At the top right hand corner, the virtual reference desk form. You can fill out a form online and send us reference questions. You can also now call the library, of course. In the bottom right hand corner, the schedule an appointment page found on the library website. You must still schedule an appointment if you wish to pick up holds, return books, or pop in and browse the collection at the library annex. And at the bottom left hand corner is a photo of StarCat, the catalog of physical library materials, which is print books, DVDs, etc. Library resources you can access from home page two. These are the digital offerings, the digital catalog, which has ebooks, audiobooks, and a handful of streaming videos. You'll also hear it called Overdrive. There are two apps for the digital catalog, Libby, which is seen in the bottom left hand corner, and Overdrive, just to the right of it. If you have a newer device, you want to use the Libby app. If you have an older device, you want to use the Overdrive app. You can also check out ebooks to an e-reader. And if you have a Kindle, it's probably self-explanatory as you go through it. You just select Kindle as the format you want when you check out your book. And it'll walk you through the steps. If you have questions about that, let us know at the library. In the top right-hand corner, or on the right side of the page, if you like, we see RB Digital. There is an app for that, too. I will note that there are more than 3,000 magazines available through RB Digital, but this particular service is being discontinued. The magazines are free. You can download as many of them as you would like and keep them forever if you'd like. So if you're looking for some new reading material, uh, feel free to check that out and download stuff while RB Digital is still available. I do not know the date as of yet, and that will be discontinued, but sometime this fall. Library blogs are full of fun content. We have the one that is Book Club for Adults. And that one basically tells you about the adult book club, the last meeting, and what book we discussed, what the upcoming book is, that sort of thing. According to NY History is the local history blog for the library, and we send out photos, well, we send out emails once a week if you subscribe to show you the photos of the week, which are local history related. Creation Stationery is the Makerspace blog, Story Musings, is a blog hosted by the library's resident author and head of adult services, Michelle Wells. And she always has some great content there about books mostly, as you might imagine. Tech and Book Talk it features information just like what it sounds like, a little bit of tips of technology and discussions and information on new books, that sort of thing. So check out the library's blogs. If you have questions about library services during the pandemic, or want to make an appointment to browse, pick up, or return items, you are welcome to go the traditional route and simply give us a call. The library's phone number is the same one it's been for years, area code 607-936-3713. That's still our number, even though we're in a different building at the moment, and it's the phone number in the telephone book. Annex hours are currently Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. Just a quick heads up, and then I'll give you specific details in the next episode of Library Connections. But there's going to be some changes in October. We will be moving back to our Civic Center Plaza location, and our hours will be changing, expanding a little bit. We'll have Saturday hours, and we'll be open a little bit later in the evening, a day or two a week. I will have more information on that in the next episode of Library Connections. Social media. Just a weekly reminder, you can connect with the library, read library news, and post questions to the library via social media. The library has pages on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram, 
and there'll be information on the timetable for the move back to our Civic Center Plaza location on our social media feeds. In relation to this video series, each video in this series is available on demand via the library's YouTube channel after it has first been shown on Facebook Live. Page one of references for this week, which I'm not going to dwell on. You feel free to click pause at this point if you want to look at them for details. And moving along to the tech tip of the week, which is a little. So I'm going to talk about how blue light can keep you awake this week. And I want to note right off the top that blue light doesn't actually appear blue to the naked eye. It's part of the white light spectrum. And there's been articles in the news about this for the last couple of years about how blue light wakes up your mind. It keeps you awake at night, uh, it, but it's still still a issue. And with so many people at home during the pandemic, I don't know if you're anything like me, but I tend to want to spend a lot of time on my phone looking at social media, looking at news stories in the evening. And I found I can't do it because it wakes me up. I don't sleep as well at night. So I thought I'd share a little bit of what I've learned about this with you all, starting out with the fact that what blue light is, basically. This is from, again, the Harvard Health Letter. It says, what is blue light? Not all colors of light have the same effect. Blue wavelengths, which are beneficial during daylight hours because they boost attention, reaction times, and mood, seem to be the most disruptive at night and the proliferation of electronics with screens, as well as energy efficient lighting, is increasing our exposure to blue wavelengths, especially after sundown. So it's kind of like if you spend too much time staring at a computer screen or the screen on your phone or your tablet, it's kind of almost like having a little cup of coffee to wake you up, which is not what we want to do at night. We want to get ready to sleep so we can sleep well and of course, if you're under the age of 30, you could probably ignore most of this because I found I slept like a log until I got to be about 35, but I'm digressing. And this screenshot is also from the Harvard Health Letter. That's in the references section if you wish to look it up and read the entire health letter. But blue light, one of the things that it does is it can suppress the secretion of melatonin and it does it more powerfully than other lights. So that can interfere with you getting to sleep and it can also interfere with you staying asleep. And I found a number of different articles on this subject. I liked one from Tara Parker Pope at the New York Times there. Her article, Six Swipes for a Better Night's Sleep. I'm open to any tips I can get at my age. She says, before bed, avoid screens. Turn off the tablet, the television, and the phone in the evening. The blue light in your screen has the same effect on your brain as sunlight, which means it wakes you up just when you want to be drifting off. Now, personally, I have found that backlit screens in the form of my phone, my iPad, and my computer, they do wake me up. I have not noticed that same effect with TV, and I haven't researched this, but I would suspect the blue light in television is a little bit less. So if you're gonna do one of those several things, maybe just watch TV in the evening. I like the article at the right, it's from The Verge. The author's name is Gregory Ferenstein, and he's trying out sunglasses to filter out the blue light. And if you can wear sunglasses, I have glasses myself, regular prescription glasses, so sunglasses aren't something that I would wear in the house because I need prescription lenses and I have transition lenses. So for me, that wouldn't work and I'm digressing. Um, you can try a pair of sunglasses, probably best to avoid, you know, tablets and smartphones and computers after say six o'clock in the evening, if you can. And I've got one more article I wanna quote from on this subject. This is actually from Consumer Reports. The article is how blue light affects your sleep. And I like this quote, our light exposure between when the sun sets and the sun rises is probably the primary driver of sleep deficiency in our society. And from personal experience, I would agree with that. When I don't stare at my phone for hours into the evening, I put it aside at six o'clock at night, and maybe just quickly check my email later in the evening, but don't spend more than 15 minutes doing it, I sleep much better. 
So just tips to help you sleep at night. And on a related note, walking outside is good for you. Go outside and you'll get some positive light. White light is good for you. And I like this particular article from Prevention. It says the 11 biggest benefits of walking to improve your health, according to doctors. And on the right, we see a paragraph from the article. It says, one of the most powerful ways to lose weight, stay healthy, and live longer is so shockingly simple, even a toddler can do it. All you have to do is put one foot in front of the other. Walking has always been my main source of cardio, and except for when I was pregnant, I've been the same weight my entire life, says fitness expert Denise Austin. The key is to strut for ideally at least 30 minutes a day. Having said that, I'm not going to read the rest of it. You get the idea, but walking can improve your mood. It can lower your blood pressure. I find it relaxing. It's something I do both for fitness and just as a, you know, like a meditative thing. I find that it helps me to center. I don't know much about Buddhism, but it does help me to center and be calmer and just feel better. So I highly recommend it. Now is a good time. The weather's getting cooler. It's great to get out and not be quite so housebound. And just as walking outside is good for you, wearing sunscreen can be too. You should check out the UV index before heading out if you're going out for a long hike. UV, of course, stands for ultraviolet radiation, and it is in regular sunlight, and it can damage your skin over time. I am showing you here the EPA sun safety page on their website, which I thought was cool. At left, you see the main page, which I would Google UV index and EPA to get it instead of typing all that epa.gov forward slash stuff in the address bar. Anyway, I'm digressing. You get that little blue card. It looks like a library card to me, but it says Enviro Facts. And then if you type your zip code in there, just to the left of the green Sherlock Holmes spyglass and hit enter or you know tap submit on your mobile device. The forecast for your geographic location will come up and it tells me that right now the UV index for where I am is at one, which is low. Generally, the higher the number, the more damaging the light can be to your skin. So if you've got something that's above three, it might be a good idea to wear some sunscreen. And here we see two screenshots from the Weather Channel app because that's a quick and easy way to see what the UV index is. Many weather apps have that information. I've got two screenshots because the first one at left shows you the top portion of the screen as it comes up. It gives you the current temperature, it tells you on a scale what the temperature is going to be throughout the day. And then you get down to today's details, which I always like to look at gives you sunrise, sunset, tells you what the wind is, humidity, dew point, pressure, and finally, UV index, which according to the Weather Channel there, the UV index is three for this location in Corning. So it might be a good idea to apply a little bit of sunscreen before going out. And that's kind of a healthy tech tip for the week. And that's all for this week. See you next week with another edition of Library Connections.